herb. Herb is a plant. I mean, herbs are good for everything. Eugene Cannabis TV, we're here and for you, talking about cannabis issues. My friend Reverend Will and Dank here. We've got some news stories to talk about, both in state and out of state, uh, all about cannabis and uh, the ridiculous prohibition of it. Uh, we have a, uh, this came from the Active Post on the internet. It's activepost.com, activistpost.com. Ten ways to war on drugs is a wild success. Yeah, okay, let's hit it. Yeah. Let's give it to you. Something Milita to think about, folks. Yeah, military industrial profits. Mm -hmm. As the Vietnam era came to an end, it struck fear into the military industrial machine and enjoyed great profits from that conflict. So now you have another conflict that can increase the profits. Right, they created another war, the drug right, war. Yep. Even though they don't want to own the fact that the war is the drug war, because if they did, then they would have to give us Geneva Convention privileges, which is one of the things I've said as a vet to begin with. I have lost two families in this. I have been put in jail. I have been, I have been harmed. Our friend, Brother John, he made up a poster one time. I just saw it the other day, and I need to revive this. It was good. He says, retropation, what's the word? Rep Reparations? Reparation, thank you. Reparation for all drug war victims that aren't dead. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so um, here, here's go read the, the next one here. This next one is huge boon to private prisons. I've said this forever, you know, the prison food is taken care of by one company. You got the prison guards there, another company. Got, oh, man. It's like huge boon to private prisons. At least 25% of their profits come from these nonviolent criminals. A great number more are held on drug-related charges that may have resulted in drug violence. However, the current trend shows that three quarters of new inmates admitted to state prisons are nonviolent offenders. Three quarters. Come on, folks. Understand between the industrial military complex and creating prisons, which, of course, if they did make this legal, then they would be able to take the prisons and use them for people who are considered terrorists, who could be anyone who disagrees with the government, because as you see, we have a difference of opinion with the government and we're being locked up now. So it's just an example of what can come. Yep, remember, this is 10 ways the war on drugs is a wild success. Number three, <laughs> prevents higher unemployment rates. Oh, this is good. Imagine if the millions of Americans currently jailed on drug charges were released into a job market already suffering from real unemployment numbers over 20%. <laughs> so. Thank heaven, don't have to worry about that. We got those people locked up. Uh, that, that's that's a good deal. <laughs> Additionally, you know, if it wasn't for drugs being illegal, countless people like DEA agents, court staff, prison guards, parole officers, drug dealers, etc., would otherwise be unemployed. Now, the next one is one that goes with another story that's related, and we'll tell you about it in a little bit. Suppresses minority populations. It's often said that the drug war is a war on minorities. According to the ACLU, African Americans make up an estimated 15% of drug users, but they account for 37% of those arrested on drug charges, 59% of those convicted, and 74% of all drug offenders sentenced to prison. Or consider this, the U.S has 260,000 people in state prisons on nonviolent drug charges. More than 70% of them are black or Latino. So it is a huge success for those who wish to suppress minority populations. <laughs> and it dries up, there's a number uh, five, <clears throat> dries up prices. Making any substance, substance illegal will result in much higher prices than a free market could dictate especially when there's a high demand for that substance. <clears throat> I always like to remember the drug dealer that says, I'm not a drug pusher. I, they call me, I don't call them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other thing is that when gold and uh, cannabis were at the same price, 
for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah. Of course, gold has gone up so much anymore, and I don't understand why. It's just, it's just a precious metal. Mm. But uh, the next one here, six, is drug violence justifies tough gun laws. The violence generated from the prohibition of drugs is reminiscent of the extreme mob violence during the prohibition of alcohol. Excuse me, folks, you walk into my house, you want to see my plants, man. All you got to do is knock on the door. I'll show them to you. It doesn't matter, except I don't have any there because I live in a small trailer. <laughs> <laughs> That's on you. It's the Mexican drug cartels and stuff, and I hate to blame the Mexicans, you know, and I'm not, you know, but this is what they say. It's the Mexican drug cartels. Fast and furious scandal. You know, it's like... It's ridiculous. The reason that they have a friend of mine right now is facing 15 years in jail, maximum, minimum, because he had two guns in his house. Now, there was a lot of people who told him not to have the guns there, but he did, and now he's facing this. And he was told just the other day that if he decides not to play the way they want him to play, that they're going to send this uh, district attorney who was called a dog. And the person who was in there on the charge was called a bone. And he was told that that dog, that district attorney, would chase that bone forever until he got that bone back. If he left the country, left the city, left the state, whatever, didn't comply to being there in court. To me, I looked over to a friend of mine and says, to me, that's a, that sounds like a direct threat to me that no matter what you do, you know, if you don't do exactly what we want, we're going we're gonna to hurt you. And that hurts me because I tell you folks, as a vet, the things that our government are doing, it makes me really sad. So the gun thing, everybody has the right to have a gun in their home. Whether they do or not is how comfortable they feel, where they live, in the area where they live, and what they've gone through as a family. It shouldn't be dictated or mandated by the police department or the justice system because it doesn't do anything to stop the criminals who want the guns from having the guns. It oh, yeah. It just stops us who have felonies for standing up for our right to have a different belief system than the status quo. In our house, we don't get to have them. We would have to hand-to-hand -hand fight you. Yeah, I, I grew up with guns. I'm the son of a nationally known gunsmith, actually. And... Uh, uh, I've always felt that that felons not having firearms is grossly unfair. Uh, I could understand it for violent fender, uh, felons, sure. but not nine. I mean, not nonviolent. That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, and that was the biggest thing I was concerned about when I was facing federal. I mean, not federal, but facing uh, felony charges at one point. I was concerned about the fact I never built own a gun again. And you know, like I said, if some of the guns that I grew up with them, I can't even imagine them having a gun. Mm -hmm. I've only got a couple, three, and I haven't shot one in probably ten years. But the fact I can't have one, yeah, that's just that isn't right. Well, the other part of this is the fact that we are law-abiding citizens. Just because you created a law yeah. that makes us not law-abiding citizens does not mean that we should not have a right to protect ourselves. Yep. Uh, let's see, this is number how are we seven. At? seven. Yes. Protects big pharma monopolies. No one is happier about the war on drugs than big pharma. They control the their control over the FDA and monopoly of controlled substances would be threatened if all drugs were legalized. Many many patients that I know I've come across and I know Will has too yeah. uh, use less prescription meds in some cases been able to quit them completely yep. because of medical marijuana. It helps them. But, however, they are using less of the meds, so it's definitely here in the pocket of big pharma. So there's an example right there. Uh, allows proxy armies. <laughs> there's another one, the militarization of police forces. This is a know. really good one, you know. It says, if you want to create an empire by force, but it's politically disadvantageous to base your army in certain countries, then the global <laughs> war on drugs is your ticket to supplying troops or creating proxy armies. One of the most recent examples is Costa Rica, a peaceful country in Central America without an army, where the U.S. bribed the government to allow the Navy and Marines to be stationed off the Caribbean coast to fight the war on drugs. In other nations where even this won't be allowed, the CIA funds and arms one of the drug cartels who then act as their hired enforcers or 
they're used as an excuse for governments to accept U.S. help to combat the enemy they created. With this one, folks, I want to let you know, whether you believe it or not or agree with me, the United States government in cahoots with Osama bin Laden has created this false image that we have that the towers when they came down was done by Osama bin Laden. There is no way that anybody with an ounce of logic in their head could watch those buildings come down, see that the planes that were in the air, the only ones that were in the air, were not supposed to be there, and none of our planes were there to stop them. And I mean, the whole ball of wax from the building falling in the back that wasn't even touched to the money that was made by the person who owned the buildings, all those things are out on the internet for you to check out and find. What this is saying right here has happened right here, and every Marine out there, I'm calling you to pay attention to this because we're the ones who are supposed to stop the infiltration and the disintegration of our government as we the people want it. So thanks yep. for that one. And then there's uh, keeps big banks flush with cash. It's been a long, it has been long known the big, pharma, the big banks happily launder money for the big drug cartels. According to the nation's office on drugs and crime and the International Monetary Fund, up to 1.5 trillion, that's a trillion, the T dollars in drug money are laundered through legal enterprises, accounting for 5% of global G, 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 GDP. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Take this this year and one bank, which, uh, Wachovia, uh, who hired to pay a slap, slap on the wrist fine. fine for laundering more than two, 420 billion. 420. I love it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? 420 yes. billion dollars uh, for Mexican drug cartels. Imagine where the big banks would be without this money, given that they are also needed a bailout of over 23 trillion for lack of sufficient deposits to pay for their gambling habits. <laughs> so, yeah, this is this is really great. It's been really good, you know. And the last one we've got here is fun CIA black ops. Do you ever wonder where the U.S. government gets all that money for their secret black ops, like underground bases, secret wars, corporate takeovers, and seed money? It's been proven over and over that the CIA and Pentagon controls a large majority of the illicit drug trade, either directly or indirectly through proxies mentioned above. They've been caught in the act of shipping in massive amounts of cocaine. And I know that when I was in the military in Vietnam, and all the pot that was coming in here was coming in the military bases. We didn't have pot growing in California and in Oregon and other places like that. It was imported. Now, was it imported? It was imported through the military. I mean, come on. They've been caught in the act of shipping massive amounts of cocaine while the CIA now openly admits to protecting and facilitating the opium trade in Afghanistan. Surprise me. If it wasn't for this tremendous profit, the CIA would not be able to build their secret shadow government. So as you can see, there are great benefits to the war on drugs. Depending what side of the coin you're on, if you're a poor pot smoker, well, you're out of luck. But if you're the biggest heroin and cocaine dealer in the world and desire a monopoly, well, you've got the right world right where you want it. You know? And along yep. with that, you know, this thing, this is next, right? Because this feeds right into what we're talking about here. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Oregon legislature, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> moves to increase marijuana fines to five thousand dollars. <coughs> Adults caught with even small amounts of marijuana face new steep fines of up to five thousand dollars under a bill introduced Friday in Oregon's abbreviated legislative session, HB 4167, would raise a maximum fine for a simple, uh, for simple possession of under one ounce from one thousand to five thousand dollars for single offense. Now, see, this is another uh, attempt by the legislature to, to try uh, to de to recriminalize, at some level, possession of pot. Uh, they tried that already. Uh, in fact, the legislature uh, actually passed the legislation to recriminalize pot in '98, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, come up with a referendum, uh, got signatures on the referendum, forced it on the ballot, and it was. Uh, uh, 
it uh, it was the referendum was passed, which stopped the recriminalization. So the government, so in other words, the legislature was wrong. They did not have the pe the people's will in mind, obviously, because the people uh, shot it down. So here they are coming back again. They don't learn. They're coming back in. Now they want to raise the fines. Now the good news is on this is it it's already dead. This is one of those bills that they waste our taxpayer money putting in. They know they know they probably don't have a chance of hell, but they still got to do it just to make their conservative friends uh, look good to their conservative friends, you know. Right, but uh, we have some friends too. Yeah, exactly. And they're getting so, ready. Uh, that's right. So now we have uh, IP24. Uh, IP24 is an initiative that they're gathering signatures for. Uh, they actually have funding. They've been told us that they have funding to pay for to, get, to pay for the signatures to get it on the ballot. It's telling us that they it will be on the ballot in November this year. So be looking for it. It's called uh, uh, Organs for Sensible Law Enforcement. Uh, and they're gathering, so you'll see them. Uh, paid petitioners have yellow petition sheets. The volunteers, they're white. It's IP24. Uh, they've gathered 24,000, 25,000 signatures already, uh, and it's sponsored by Citizens for Law Enforcement, which defeated last, the past efforts to enhance marijuana penalties uh, in 98, so just that I mentioned. Uh, IP24 is a brief constitutional amendment that permits adults 21 and over to possess and produce marijuana for personal use. Now, two things I want to mention out real quick, because one, it's a constitutional amendment. That's good, and that's also bad news. The good news is that once it's passed, the legislature cannot screw with it. That's the good part. The bad part is it takes more signatures to get it on the ballot. Plus, we have our uh, detractors saying, well, this is a constitutional amendment. We shouldn't be doing constitutional amendments for something like this. So we are, we're fighting against that. So that's the good and the bad. But, uh, and also the 21 age. A lot of people, including myself, and I'm sure Will, would say 18-year-olds should be able to smoke pot. But uh, the fact is that two states have tried it, and they both failed. Oregon's one of them. In 1986, uh, they, tried, they went 18 and above, and it failed. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing something controversial, you've got to stay with 21 and above because there's too many people around the fence that aren't going to go on our side if you drop below 21. We could change it later. But right now, we've got to go with 21 just to get it legalized because we're fighting years of propaganda, public ignorance, and like I say, Toker's apathy too. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So but, <clears throat> just so you know, you can go to uh, www.nprohibition.com again, or call. Again, that, that, that's a beautiful thing. The, the website is nprohibitionagain.com. Okay. Okay. I like that again because it, it, you know, it tells it like it is. Again. Right, and there's also a phone number there. It's 541-228-1634, Robert Wolf being the chief petitioner for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert. You bet. Very well spoken, and it's an excellent campaign, and it's really rolling. So one of the things uh, when we were talking... Oh, excuse me. Well, you meant, yeah, you, know, you're gonna, you were going to come back to this, and we forgot about the minority... Uh, right, I got it right here. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, what we're talking about here is a young man, yeah. 18 years old, who will never take another breath because he was shot in the chest by a police officer. This happened in Bronx, New York, and uh, it's the eighth person to die in the U.S. drug law enforcement operation so far this year. And it appears to have been over a small amount of marijuana. I mean, you have to understand this this kid's mother, 39 years old now, you know, is just shaking her head because, I mean, it's hard to believe that a police officer can shoot somebody over marijuana. Yeah, he was allegedly trying to flush drugs down the toilet in his own home in his own when home. he was killed by a police officer, uh, and he was not armed, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the mother actually and the six-year-old were in an apartment at the same time and was only told that uh, it had to do with drugs, you know, that uh, they came in and, and actually shot him. So, you know, this is recent, folks. This is February 3rd that this is coming out. So <clears throat> it's one of the things that we're definitely concerned with here is the fact that there's an overkill. I mean, you have declared a war on drugs, and the drugs are a symptom of problems. The reason people do drugs is either because of pain, uh, physical pain, or it's like you know not being able to deal with uh, things, uh, injustices that have happened to them in the past. 
and that you know why we don't have this right is because of big pharma and because of all the money that can be made off of it. Now, if that's not a crime, uh, you tell me what is, because there's such a monopoly through big pharma that when we have something that can be so beneficial in so many ways, medically and otherwise, for our country, and it's all being pigeonholed through the DEA so that you cannot even grow industrially because you can't get a federal tax stamp to give them a sample so that you can grow. I mean, people who are happy about us getting industrial through here in Oregon, once again, they're only fooling themselves. Until we get the federal tax stamp change, they're not going to be growing anything industrially. Yeah, it says, when an identified officer confronted him in the bathroom, Graham spun around, and according to police, there was a struggle, and the officer then shot him in the chest. It wasn't clear what caused the officer to fire. Graham was pronounced dead at a local hospital. A small amount of pot was floating in the toilet bowl. Uh, <clears throat> this reminds me of uh, the incident here where we had a young gentleman, uh, well, gentleman, whatever, but stole a pickup, uh, 42nd Main in Springfield. The officer's, uh, he's, his pickup became incapacitated. <clears throat> he went to take the guy into control, and the kid opened up the door, and the cop said, I thought he had a gun, and shot, and shot him and killed him. And he was, it was justified by our esteemed district attorney at the time, Douglas Hulko Road, which is yeah. a real, I won't get into him right now. But no. Anyway, uh, he's, uh, so that was, and that's the new policy now, in, in, at least in Lane County. If an officer believes you have a gun, he can kill you and get away with it. So that's where we're at, folks. So right now, here, our last story for the moment is the one about these uh, people in Idaho. Oh, yes. Oh. Okay, we have a 50-year-old man who told police he was a medical marijuana card holder from Oregon has been arrested. They found five pounds of pot in his vehicle. On Sunday, deputies pulled over Curtis Vanderboren of Ashland, Oregon, for an equipment violation in Payette County. Yeah, excuse me, I need to cut you short. We're just, we're, we're out of time, but okay. uh, this was a, but the prior to that was the one that was, the bigger one was, is it uh, <clears throat> Oregon State cop pulled over a, a, a car in Ontario, California, smelled pot. The guy told him he was a card holder. The cop let him go, but he called Idaho. <clears throat> Idaho pulled him over, and of course, Idaho, no, uh, no medical marijuana law, and he had 68 pounds. So Oregon State cops were actually telling the Idaho, here he comes, so... Anyway, we've got to wrap up here. We're completely out of time, so <clears throat> so much to talk about. Appreciate it, and come back and see us again, and we'll talk some more. Peace and love and cannabis. And we have another segment of M Research, our friend Troy, and uh, talking all about uh, what the program is, what it's about, what it's doing, and where we're going. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Oregon Citizen Review, uh, tell us uh, what that's about. Okay, so one of the things that uh, uh, people get from this is, is, is uh, we get a lot of feedback is there, you seem to really be overthinking things. <laughs> and, and we believe it's kind of necessary to kind of take things to the next level because we're trying to change policy. Mm -hmm. We've got policy built on malarkey and it impacts people. At the end of the day, people go to jail and they shouldn't, right? So if, if people were just getting... Um, dry skin or if they were just leaving mildly annoyed, we would probably be very less, we'd be much less um, active about what we're doing. But the fact is, is that you've got a medicinal who does not provide a lethal or a lethality to it that could be helping lots of people, but we have policy like in another space we were talking about the inclusion of uh, race issues of where you have one group of people uh, uh, you know, supposedly romancing another group of people, and so that's a great reason to make marijuana uh, illegal. What we've done is, is we understand and what we really enjoy about the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program as it stands is it's probably the best worded law in the United States. Best worded, maybe not the best law, but the best worded law. We know when we're crossing the line in Oregon. Okay, mm -hmm. So it's very clear what's legal and what's not. It's written fairly simply. But at the same time, because this is, and we call it agri-medinomics, Okay, this represents billions and billions, not, not just 
registrations at the OMMP office with the, the 100 or 200 or $20 or the whatever, that, that's nice. I mean, they're gonna, apparently they're using that to build parks and wonderful things like that. I'm talking about bringing a Fortune 200 to Oregon that's dispersed across the agriculture industry that allows people to be able to have Silicon Valley of medicine in Oregon and all of the other things that come. And so if that was our goal, if our goal was to take this seriously and treat it as the resource that it is, one of the things that we would do is start, is start working with citizens in Oregon about if they could wave a magic wand and have a perfect medical marijuana program, what would it look like? And so what we do is we go and facilitate brainstorming sessions in, in regional cities like Portland, like Corvallis, like Eugene, like Medford, Bend, out on the coast, and encourage everybody, everybody, everybody that's against it, everybody that's for it, everybody that just wants to show up, and we create a very creative brainstorming at uh, atmosphere to, to gather all the best of ideas. Mm -hmm. At the conclusion of this process, we will then aggregate and evaluate with citizens to create kind of a, an open letter to the Oregon Legislative Group, and from that, use that as a tool from people who are Agri traditional agriculturalists, to people who are from the Canna Group, from law enforcement, from, from legislative people who are in the cities and all walks of life. We want teachers and we want growers and we want patients and we want their doctors and we want all these people contributing to this pool because in there we will find the best solutions. Mm -hmm. So Oregon currently has the best worded or clearest worded, but what we're working to do is have Oregon have the best overall program. <clears throat> we like to say that the uh, medical marijuana law in the state of Oregon was written to pass, not to work. So that's <laughs> what yeah, so we're trying to make it work. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, but uh, well, yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah, that, it's 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 like I say, it's all good because <laughs> uh, we need all the help we can get, and we're working within the system, and uh, this is uh, excellent. That's one of the things I really enjoy about this program is it's so completely legal. The testing even is is legal. It's just it's just so it's just bugs me because yes, there's money exchange. There's money exchange is when the grower pays for the services of Charlie's organization, but he's not doing anything illegal. So right. it's beautiful. There's money exchange, but it's not illegal because they're not they're not exchanging marijuana for money. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's services. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's a consulting fantastic. service, and and what we want is we want to help. Uh, patients access new medicines that will best benefit them. Definitely. If huh? you're a patient and you were to ever be charged, or because there's people who have kind of tried to simulate this project on behalf of us, mm -hmm. if, if, if a person were to ever to be asked as a patient to ever pay anything, then you know you're not working with us. Just, yeah. just oh, flat yeah. out. Good point. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks so much. And uh, again, that's patients at mscale, that's m scale.com. Uh, and to get a hold of uh, Troy and get a hold of, find out about the program and, and get connected. So we appreciate our segment once again, Troy. Thank, thank you, you very much, yeah. Why them say you must not use the herb? You see? And we take that and we can't find